Hello and welcome to chapter 10 which deals with property, plant, and equipment. So we'll get started here. Property, plant, and equipment um, is one of the subjects that we're really talking about for chapter 10, but that's the title of the chapter. Uh, really what we're talking about in chapter 10 are long-lived revenue producing assets and they're typically classified into two categories. The first one is property, plant, and equipment. This includes things like land, buildings, equipment, machines, automobiles, furniture, natural resources, computers, furniture and fixtures. A lot of things go into the property, plant, and equipment category. The second category of long-lived revenue producing assets are intangible assets. Intangible assets lack a physical substance. Usually you can't touch them. They include things such as patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade names, franchises, and goodwill. Um, what we talk about when we talk about capitalizing an asset is creating an asset on our books and capitalizing the cost of it. And we'll hold that cost until <coughs> The future periods when it helps us to generate revenue and then we'll allocate a small part of that cost through depreciation to match with the revenue that it helps to generate so the matching principle again the initial cost of the property plant and equipment and intangible assets include the purchase price and all expenditures necessary to bring the asset to its desired condition and location for use um, <clears throat> so anything that we are paying for uh, to get the asset from where we bought it to the c place where we're going to use it, any expenditures that need to be done to fix the asset or clean the asset or paint the asset, anything that needs to be done for installation, test runs, safety checks, all of those things would be um, to get the necessary for desired condition and location for use. Our original journal entry for <coughs> long-lived revenue producing assets is a debit to an asset account and either a credit to the cash or the payable account. And then we capitalize that cost so that we can depreciate it later. Um, if we think about equipment, which is part of property, plant, and equipment, um, some of the costs that we would capitalize for equipment would be the purchase price plus sales taxes minus any discounts. So if you got a discount, um, a sales discount, a cash discount, um, the manufacturer had a coupon, it was on sale, any type of discount would reduce the purchase price. Oh. And then I have transpiration costs. That sounds like I had a bad spell check. It should be transportation costs. So anything that you're paying to move the equipment to the place where you're going to use it. Uh, costs for installing and testing. So if you do test runs and you waste materials when you're doing the test runs, that's included in the costs. And if you have to create any platforms or foundations or put safety equipment around it like fences, all of those would be included in the purchase price. And also if you incur any legal fees to establish titles, so if you have to file any paperwork with regulatory agencies, if you have to pay any um, fees to state and local governments, if you have to uh, go through the bank and have them um, purchase title insurance for you, this is generally more for land, but if you have any legal fees to establish the title for equipment, that would also be included. Well, we'll go to the cost of land next. Um, land <clears throat> is considered to have an infinite life. If you went on outside and you looked at a piece of land and then you came back in 75 years, there would still be dirt on the ground. So land has a fine, infinite life. It may go on forever. For the cost of land, we include the purchase price. Um, and that includes the cost of any structures on the land if they're going to be raised or destroyed. So if you're looking at a piece of property and you want to build, let's just say, um, a warehouse and parking lots and make it for your use, and currently there's a barn and maybe an old shack. If you're going to demolish the barn and the old shack, then the entire purchase price is allocated towards land because you're not using any of the existing structures. Um, any cost to demolish the old structures, in our example of the barn and the shack, there's any cost for that. 
<clears throat> now sometimes when you go to demolish an old structure it'll have items of value so you're going to tear down an old barn sometimes old barn wood is very sought after um, there's a lot of restoration work that is done with old barns. You may get some money back. So if you can sell that wood, any um, profit you'd make would reduce the purchase price. Also, title insurance or other fees. Banks generally require title insurance when you're purchasing and, and uh, taking out a loan, so that would be included in the cost. Commissions, this is usually for your realtor. You know, you have a, um, a realtor and land transactions. Uh, delinquent property taxes, so if the land had old property taxes and you had to go back and pay for the back taxes or the old taxes from prior years that the owner didn't pay, um, sometimes you'll do that. You'll just pay the old taxes to take the lien off the property to facilitate the sale. Any cost of grading the land, so if you have to flatten the land or fix the land, if, if, if there's um, you need to bring in fill or, or clean it out in any way, clean up brush, etc. All of that would be included in the cost of the land. Um, what you should not include in the price of the land is property taxes for the future. Many times when you purchase a property, you have to pay <coughs> the seller any property taxes because they're all paid um, in advance and uh, sometimes they're put into escrow. So if you pay any property taxes or anything insurance that is associated with future use, like so um, anything from the day after the sale on into the future, that is separate. You should include that as property tax expense or prepaid insurance and does not become part of the cost of the land. And again, land is not a depreciable asset because it has an indefinite life. Land is not depreciated. So it is part of property, plant, and equipment, but it is not depreciated. However, our next slide talks about land improvements. <clears throat> land is non-depreciable. We can't depreciate it, but land improvements are. Land has an indefinite life, but improvements such as parking lots do have a definite life. So sometimes what we have is just dirt. <clears throat> so if you went back out to that <clears throat> same location, you'd still have dirt in 70 years, even if you didn't do anything. But if we talked about a parking lot, if I had a parking lot and I went back to that parking lot and didn't do anything for 75 years, it wouldn't look like a parking lot anymore. Probably look more like the woods. So anything that would have to be um, maintained and has a definite life uh, is included as a land improvement. And businesses often want to classify things as land improvements instead of land because land improvements are depreciable. So they can take that cost and lower their tax return. So some examples of land improvements are parking lots, lighting, driveways, private roads, fences, and lawn and garden um, sprinklers. So anything to maintain the grass and any uh, like underlying pipes, wires, all those sorts of things. Anything done to improve the land so that you can use it would be considered a land improvement. And those are, again, depreciable compared to the land itself, which is not depreciable. So next we're going to talk about natural resources. Um, so natural resources that provide long-term benefits are reported as property, plant, and equipment. Some examples of these um, product of these, excuse me, <laughs> some examples of these natural resources are timber tracks, mineral deposits, oil, gas. So mineral deposits, we might be talking about um, precious metals or precious stones. So all of those are considered natural resources. Um, if the company develops these assets, then the capitalized costs include, and we have four things here, the acquisition cost, or the cost to acquire the rights to explore, the exploration costs, so the costs incurred for searching for the natural resources, um, which can be extensive, you know, if you're looking for those, and then development costs, which include um, many things that we would create in order to be able to do the work. So if you're thinking sort of like the picture that I have there of the, it looks like a coal mine and they have a track and they have a tunnel and they have a shaft taking the coal up 
all those things would have to be created. They would have to build the tunnel. They'd have to put in the track. They'd have to f put in the shaft. Uh, most mining has some extensive and expensive equipment that is used for hauling things out. So all of those things um, would be a capitalized cost. And then in mining, we have restoration costs. Uh, when we do mining, and uh, there's lots of different types of mining, but oftentimes mining takes a tool on the land and it doesn't look like the land from when they started. Um, oftentimes it's very ugly. Uh, it's taken down to like bare rock. So um, the federal government has said that's an externality <coughs> and requires them to, to put the land back to its original condition. So when they're done mining, they have to plant grass and trees. Um, maybe they have to do some soil work to bring it back to its original condition. They can't just leave it <coughs> the way they are the way it is when they are done mining it. And sometimes there's also what is known as an asset retirement obligation. So an asset retirement obligation can be created when there is a legal obligation associated with the disposition of property, plant, and equipment. So oftentimes this happens with oil and gas extraction where there is the requirement to bring the land back to <clears throat> its, its old use. Uh, the asset retirement obligation is measured at fair value and is recognized as a liability and corresponding increase in asset valuation. So you create that as part of your capitalized cost but then you would show a liability. There is an illustration 10-3 um, on page 508 that shows an example of um, finding the value of the asset retirement obligation. The asset retirement obligation is calculated by finding the present value of the expected cash flows. Um, I would suggest that when this video, <coughs> well I'm going to be done in a minute, this video is done that you go to page 508 and kind of look over that illustration and then we'll look at it again when I see you in class. Um, I only have about 15 minutes that I can do each video and it's about 12 minutes so I'm going to stop here and have this be the end of our first half and then you can look for the second video there'll be a second video and I'll pick back up and I'll talk about intangible assets and finish up the theory for chapter 10. Thanks so much for watching and I'll talk to you again in a minute.